uh, this is definitely like uh, the the place to do so i'm just gonna pull up one more thing All right, so we're going to start off with Astralis. So Astralis, in their game so far, the shining light has been Kobe. Kobe, though, is always being put in very tough spots due to Astralis's draft identity. What Astralis is trying to do is to pick full top side together with jungle and top, and then they're dropping bot in most games. I believe that Kobe and Yonghoon are by far the best performers on the team, and I think 1-1-3 has done better than we expected. But they're always being put in situations where their bot lane picks are very unoptimized. So in this particular scenario, uh, everything gets banned. Ezreal, Zeri, Lucian, Caitlyn, Yumi is out. All, of, all good champions are out, and the enemy has Varus, and he needs to find a champion that is useful into the enemy team. And he's playing Zaya now into Acacio. So Cassiopeia here was a very genius pick, we can talk about that later when we talk about Team Heretics uh, because Cassio is of course seeing uh, three champions that she's very good into Cassio is good into Fiora because of the dash and the W and she can kite and hit and Viego the same way, Rise of course the same way Here Zaya is picked and in this particular game Zaya was so fed in such good condition she could have potentially carried but she will never be able to trade autos with something like Cassio so her range was definitely a problem so yeah, Cassio could be in, in range with everybody, and all Mercer had to do this game was to rush Mikhail's, which completely diffused Astralis' composition. And this is the main thing, right? When you have a team like Astralis, you're going to struggle with players really wanting to show their strengths to the world uh, instead of playing to win as a group, because you're going to look a lot more uninteresting uh, as a group if you do that, right? Imagine a situation here, like the Fiora is something that we want to see less of, uh, maybe they could have been playing like Sejuani together with Fiora, but players want to show their strengths, right? We continue with the next game. Same thing here. They drop, they pick Syndra, Viego, Kesante, 1, 2, 3. Enemy picks Varos and then they drop bot. They get Ezreal and Bard. And they're playing Bard into Akali, Fiora, Sejuani showing with no support picked. Astralis, their only strength is always be getting pinholed down into picking a uh, full bot lane 4 5. When in reality, you know. Maybe they deserve a little bit more priority. We continue to their final game of the weekend, and that was, of course, against G2. And I was very happy with this direction because they get to play Caitlyn Lux and Sejuani is picked and they drop 4-5 with their solo laners. I think this was probably one of the better looks for Astralis in terms of draft, but they play up against a very strong G2, so they had a very tough time. Why are we putting Astralis in D tier coming into week 2? Is because if you want to have a team that causes upsets against other teams, they need to bring something to the table uh, that is awkward enough to create scenarios that they might take away wins. I feel like currently the mid lane meta is too, too harsh. Uh, not harsh is not the correct word, but too set in order for Dior to break through and leverage the fact that he plays something different than everybody else. Everyone remembers his Vex and the Javan and the combos. There is no awkwardness when it comes to playing against Astralis. And if they want to play in a clean way, I, I, I doubt that this is going to find them any victories. So I put Astralis uh, in, in the lowest position here. Uh, next one coming up, I would say SK. SK definitely uh, redeemed themselves uh, a little bit coming into the third game. I think when you look at SK, uh, my eyes was, of course, on Markun, who had a decent year at XL. The question was, why was Markun let go from XL? They brought in Xerxes instead. You know, that was like kind of a conversation that we had in our mind. I think Exekick has been showing uh, some, some, some decent strength. Dos as well in the lane phase. I think his Renata gameplay was was gorgeous. This is a team that that is showing some some promise and some hope. Uh, Sertos had a good game on his Silas. Uh, all in all, let's take a look at their games in terms of their drafts. There was uh, uh, the first initial SK game. I'm trying to find it. This one was very strange, right? So they picked Cassidy, and then they had the Kesante blind, and then the Renekton, and they picked Cassidy here. 
Usually you don't want to pick Kassadin into so many champions that can just one-shot you and CC you, right? In this case, there's a Renekton on the enemy team, Lucian, Wukong, all champions that are pretty decent. And Victor is a champion that can actually lane and, and pressure you early. Uh, uh, of course, um, contrary to popular belief. Another thing, uh, part about this is with the, how the game was playing out, SK was actually given a lot of room to breathe. But what we saw time and time again was that Markun was just ulting in with Vi and we were looking for fights that just weren't necessary. Big lack of patience, SK started out of the gate looking very awkward. Next follow-up was uh, the, the next game they played against BDS. This was one of the dirtiest games we saw all split long. Uh, it was a very dirty one. It is. It was exactly what you would imagine with two teams that uh, you'd expect to be on the bottom of the table. Uh, but uh, Crowney stood tall and he played super well. Uh, coming into this game, he managed to squeeze uh, the team fights and then eventually, you know, he was uh, the the king of the chaos that was created in this game. Finally, this is where SK took their win. Uh, to be fair, Team Retics really threw this one, but uh, I think SK was definitely in a very good position due to the tough work of Exekick and DOS. They played super, super well the lane phase. Of course, Team Retics bot lane uh, has been super, super abysmal so far in what we've seen. Uh, Renata here usually doesn't look like that great of a pick into Lulu and Varus, but DOS really, really made it work. And the DOS and Exekick really had a fantastic game. Zeri was Infinity Edge, uh, finished with three core against the Varus that only had Ginzu uh, finished. Jack Spectra was non existent in this game. Of course, everyone remembers all oh, the Team Heretics Portal in and uh, Ebi and. Uh, of course, um, Ruby just inting the game and the enemy being able to finish. But the main thing is that uh, I think SK had really good conditions to win the game regardless because of the conditions of Exekick and how strong he was. Another thing about this game was I think it was very redeeming for Malcolm too. I think he played a lot better and uh, uh, the level 3 gank on mid definitely set up uh, Certus for success on the Silas. So all in all, I think SK is definitely better than... Um, I, th I would say the desk is definitely better than um, than Astralis, uh, but still a ninth place uh, seems pretty reasonable. So here, this is where I'm a little bit unsure, so I'm going to do it as we go. But I'm going to put up uh, BDS here. Uh, we're going to put them on the left side to show that they are above uh, SK. Uh, maybe I'm going to move SK and BDS up one tier. I need to see how the rest of it plays out. Uh, but to talk about BDS, I think BDS have shown, you know... I think BDS, in this particular game that they played, I think on the draft side was very tricky. Uh, Malrang uh, welcomed Adam back into, uh, the, um, into the league with a friendly level 2 gank on Sejuani. I think that um, this game showcased some of the weaknesses of Koi, but BDS couldn't really play the game because like this 5-pick Vi into Sejuani and Renekton is very questionable. Uh, you have Jin AD carry, which is uh, relatively weak, and the enemy is already showing one tank, and then they pick two bulk, bulky champions too. This was a very tough game for BDS to do anything at all in, uh, so this was just, uh, I think, uh, a situation where BDS uh, was, was weaker. I think this one was very dirty because BDS, I think, with their champions, couldn't really find ways to flank, right? They couldn't find ways to, 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 to flank. They couldn't find ways to... Uh, find success with the Akali. They were always trying to walk into the enemy team with the Caitlyn first and to build around the Caitlyn, which kind of makes sense because Crowny is, is the strongest player. But all in all, you know, I think it it was it it, it just was a was a very awkward game that they managed to kind of pull through it. Like if you watch that game, you'll be very dizzy. I got dizzy. You know, some optimization in draft here as well, Caitlyn. If you pick Caitlyn, picking Mauka makes sense, right? Instead of picking Sejuani, the ones who synergize with melee champions, the one to all in. And those champions are going to be, of course, worse with Caitlyn. BDS, I think that they are in the process of kind of finding some kind of identity. And I hope that they go all the way through it, right? But the issue is that in that search for that identity, there might be elements that are contradicting. Because Adam wants to play the Darius and the Olaf, 
But in reality, I think that Labrov, together with Crowney, has been, you know, the the way forward and the way to, to, to win games. So we will have to pay attention to how BDS find the balance in that. Finally, finally, they had their game against uh, Excel, which was another dirty one. Here, Ada managed to soul kill Odomne twice. Uh, Caden Lux uh, did really, really good. They got 2v2 kills. They were in conditions to potentially win, but in the end, you know, uh, they just didn't have the juice and I would say maybe the finesse to, to, to close out the game and to put themselves in a position. I think that the general feeling that I get from BDS is that a lot of the ERL games that I watch is lacking in this department too, and I think currently they are thinking and playing very much like an ERL team. And the question is, will they be able to level it up? Because somehow this BDS game versus Excel was dirtier than this one. So now I'm looking at this, right? I think SK versus BDS is very arguable. It's just that in terms of the standings, the fact that, um, you know, uh, BDS beat SK, uh, honestly... In the grand scheme of things, I think the head-to-head -head ratio actually doesn't matter, so... The more and more I think about it, I am kind of more inclined to put SK above BDS. And uh, this is a little change-up that I'm going to do <laughs> in the moment. I forgot how bad these two games were. And I think that the memory of how SK played in this one was definitely the one that was sticking out. But um, I think Dawson Exekick... Uh, I think I think that they, they were convincing in that game against Team Heretics. Okay. The next team for me, I, I think here it becomes a little bit tougher. Um I would say I would have to put Team Heretics. And I think it could even go so far to put Team Heretics here. Uh because basically looking at Team Heretics games, um Ebi seems to be doing fine. Uh, Ebi did play two, three games of Kaysanta. So the question is, you know, how are they going to maneuver themselves around situations where Kaysanta isn't picked? Can Ebi perform on more champions than Kaysanta? I'm sure he can, but it's something that we can ask as a question. Uh, we have, um, uh, let's take a look at the first game, uh, Team Heretics versus Astralis. This was a game where I think Cassiopeia, the ingenuity of Cassiopeia here was really solid. Ruby has played Cassiopeia in the past. I think Cassiopeia carried them. I didn't necessarily think that they played much better than Astralis. But I think that Cassiopeia was so strong in this particular draft that it just didn't matter how they played. I think Mercer itemization here on, on of course, the, the Mikhails was super good. But I have to say that... Already this game was extremely alarming. So Jack Spectra is a player that has, very, has always been rumored to be very strong around lane and play do lane dominant champions. And Mercer is the type of player that has always, you know, supported his team through roams and always played around Vitil, right? And they haven't managed to figure out what they really want to do uh, with themselves. I think currently Team Heretics bot lane in the first three games that we saw probably on paper has looked the weakest. And that is a big problem. Uh, I think Team Heretics maybe are fighting against Excel for, for, for this conversation. But it seems like they are not in sync about what they want to accomplish. They don't have good understanding of how they want to play their matchups. And I have to add the caveat here that of course I haven't looked at the pro view. I can only look through the lens of what the broadcast is showing. So maybe if I know the details I might have a different opinion or a more like a less vague opinion, maybe I can target this is Mercer's mistake or this is Jack Spectre's mistake. Uh, so take it, of course, with a grain of salt. But all in all, Team Heretics bot lane has shown to be a liability and it showed in this game too, because Kobe almost carried this one. You know, Kobe did well in this game, but as we mentioned before, Astralis just didn't have the draft to, to pull through and Cassiopeia was definitely really, really strong here. After as well, even though Cassiopeia, the pick was super, super strong, I wasn't super impressed by Ruby's Cassiopeia play. I think it looked kind of stiff, but at the same time, it's a champion that maybe you haven't played as much in the recent uh, time, so I am fine with that. I'm perfectly happy with players picking champions that are on paper, really insane in games, and they play maybe 10, 20% worse than something that they've really hard practiced, uh, just to be able to secure those wins. I think there's definitely 
value on that. He did have some fantastic Kasupe ults, I'll give him that. We continue to the next game with Team Heretics. I think this was just a complete draft gap. Uh, Team Heretics was completely lost in draft. And I think also in terms of gameplay, it, it left a lot to desire. They kept taking fights that seemed unfavorable. But at the same time, it's like, when would the fights be favorable? So, you know, that's okay. Here, to pick Kalista into Zeri is bold. They pick Wukong together with it. So, you know, Wukong maybe isn't on the same wavelength as a Kalista. Sejuani, Vitality showing a different colors. And Sejuani and Jax, they just decide, we're going to drop support and not pick Yumi into the Kalista because that's where we're going to fall into the enemy trap. Uh, here, uh, of course, Vitality are banning Renata because Kalista Renata is a combo. And I think what Team Heretic should have done is to pick Renata on three and then ban supports that are good into Renata, still ban the Yumi and then maybe the Kama or the Lulu, and then be very happy because you have the Kalista Renata combo. But instead, the Kisanta is banned and then he bans Renata. Your response needs to be instantly to ban Braum. Uh, if you have the intention to last pick mid, uh, you need to remove Braum. Braum is a champion that is going to be good into all of the engage supports and most of the time uh, with Kalista you're going to look to pick an engage support. The other way around is that you just pick Azir on 4 and Azir Kalista have very good synergy together uh, but instead they pick Nautilus and then the enemy gets the Braum and the Azir and then you have this immovable fortress with tanky champions that Kassadin would never be useful against. Kassadin scales well but it's very important to remember the context. He's not going to scale well against this team. Because this team is just going to scale better. They have more CC. They have a Braum shield to, to block the first combo. You're going to have so, need so many items to be useful. You need like five, six items. It was a terrible five pick. Same time, no synergy with what Kalista wants to accomplish. And in this game, once again, Team Heretics, Kalista and Nautilus, the way they were managing the bot wave looked very awkward. They didn't really find any opportunities to, to pressure the Zeri Braum. And it seemed like they didn't have any understanding of how to play the lane matchup, nor how to control uh, their lane, which is a very big problem if you have the guts to pick Kalista. So here, I felt like Kaiser, Neon, Masterclass played super good. And I think that there was a situation around mid where uh, perks entered. But all in all, you know, Team Heretics still really bad draft. And once again, eyes on the bot lane. Looking at the final game that they played, here they went for the Varus Lulu, and I can tell you guys this, like the Varus and Lulu got monster fisted in lane. Uh, Silas got a level 3 gank onto mid, uh, put Azir in a bad spot, and then Silas, um, of course, uh, you know, he uh, managed to roam into bot, and SK showed a lot of cohesion. Honestly, this was by far the best SK game, but uh, there was some throws involved and team heretics. Found some moments where they were grouping up as five and they were team fighting and doing well. So that was still, you know, some good sides of Team Heretics. I think sometimes they show very good principles and a good understanding of what they needed to do with their composition. But there is a lot of elements that leave a lot to desire that I feel uh, are going to hold them back from ever showing their strengths. And the main concern still for me is the bottom side. I think that Ebi has performed well. I think Jankos has performed fantastic. I think the Ruby has been on and off. I think he's been decent. I don't care too much about the hex gates. The issue, the game against SK was that Zeri got way too strong and that was a danger in itself. There was a game state at one point where Zeri had infinity edge over Varus and Varus had two core. He had Ginzu, Shieldbow, and that was already rough. Zeri, Renata were winning lane pretty hard against Varus Lulu. And that is because of a lot of different things, but this is something that Team Heretics needs to solve. And uh, I can see a world where Team Heretics drop a game against BDS, and this is where the surprises can happen. But I think that Yankos and, of course, Evi has shown enough redeeming qualities to put them here, and Ruby too. We continue. The next team in line for me is uh, XL. And I think there's there's reason to put Excel here too. Um, there's reasons to put Excel here too. Um, I think that um, Excel has been very disappointing. The first opening game against G2, you know, uh, they got uh, murdered, you know. Everyone did against G2, uh, so, you know, that's okay. 
<laughs> that's perfectly okay. Uh, we can look at the other games as maybe better examples. Here, they had a significant draft gap and they just couldn't for some reasons. Like, it, it looks so disjointed. They were taking fights when they don't have the same, um, they don't have the right amount of players on the screen. They didn't take opportunities that were very obvious. The way they were stacking waves was not the greatest. They're wasting each other's time. They are playing very tense. It looks like they don't have anyone that is kind of connecting them together and figuring out a way to kind of uh, progress the game. It looks very, very awkward. It, it, it's, it's like one of those situations from outside it looks like that Excel would play better if they weren't in team comms. That's how it looks like. Because I think that the individual pieces are just better. And I think if there's a situation where they don't talk and don't confuse each other, I think they would actually play better. Because these players are playing better in solo queue than what they are doing on stage. And this is where it becomes so, so weird. They seem so... I don't know how to say it. But they seem so stiff. A good, a good example is, like someone mentioning in the chat right now, it's like there was the dive operation on top, they're hovering, they're not taking red, and they're just hovering, and then the wave top doesn't crash, and then it's like they just waste a lot of time, a lot of pressure, and then all of the pressure was gone. Later on, their team fights were much stronger, but then Patrick just uh, kind of threw it and, and, and played it not so great, and uh, then there was a situation, so Oduamne W is a pink ward, and there's just a lot of like small things that just ruin the game. Ruins the game on the spot. And that can be rough to be, be in that position for best of one. But when I'm trying to look at the redeeming qualities of Excel, it is just the hope of what we had before the season that Excel is going to do well. In terms of what we can look at on the first initial week, in terms of what is redeeming, in terms of the gameplay, right now, very little. Um, but then again, you know, I think Excel, we can easily put them here. I just need to see uh, how I build out the rest of the list. I think after Excel, I would have to put Koi. I think, you know, Koi, the main redeeming quality for Koi is that it seems like Malrang is the only one that hadn't, hasn't had a long off season. Um, Koi made the change of uh, swapping out Oduamne for um, for um, for Shigenda, and I think that Malrang in the winds has been the one carrying. But Koi is struggling so hard to be five people on the same page, and in a lot of cases where, like I remember this game, the game against Fnatic where Malrang is trapping the enemy for a full minute, and it seems like the team... Obviously, I'm just speculating because I don't know the comms, but it, it looks like he has to force people to, to come together and to fight with him. Uh, Koi has looked very disjointed, even in the game that they won. The game against Excel was such a steal uh, that uh, I feel worried about placing Koi higher. Koi right now doesn't look like a team, and this is a team that changed one part uh, another thing is that Koi was rumored to not have scrimmed so much in December. Uh, obviously, it's a rumor, so I don't know if it's true or not. And it seems like those growing pains are there. And that, to me, is what brings concerns about Koi. But what makes Koi great? Why, why is Koi better than the other teams? Well, individually, they're still, still very strong players, and they have a lot of pedigree to, to work on. And I think Malrang has been a very shining, strong spot for his team. So here Malrang level 2 gank top and really broke the top matchup, which was a super big deal, and then he managed to recover the game. Malrang has, has, has been playing super, super good. Uh, another thing about Koi, right, is that uh, in this particular game, Lucian, Yumi, Caitlyn was out, and then we picked Heimerdinger a Jin, and then they dropped full bot because they were happy to play into Heimerdinger a Jin. But uh, I think that uh, Koi, you know, I'm still waiting for their bot lane to be, to showcase that they are the strength with the Caitlyn play and so forth, but... Caitlyn Lucian is not something they've been allowed to pick uh, ever so far. Uh, we continue into the next Koi game, which was against Excel. This is a very dirty one. Uh, they have the Maokai, the Kalista Maokai. They played into the Lucian Nami. Enemy banned Caitlyn away. 
there's never going to be a case where Koi gets Caitlyn and Lucian, and that's why where they can, of course, lose some of their teeth uh, in the bottom side. Uh, Koi is the type of team that needs to figure out how they want to approach the meta, and I think uh, eventually, you know, Koi has had moments in the past where they had like ruts and 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 rough play. This is definitely a team that can bounce back, and we'll just have to see how they do it together with, I mean, without Odoamna in this case. Here too, I think Cassidy was kind of greedy, picking Cassidy into Vi, Renekton, Lucian, I think is super hard, uh, but they kind of stole a victory here off of the mistakes of Excel. And then finally, this is a game that we really don't stream, but we saw a lot of problems with Koi's gameplay. Uh, here, Fnatic showed the strength of Ash and Maokai and Jace together. They had a very powerful composition that was very tough to break, but Koi looked very awkward in that one, and they were almost never five people on the same screen and that in the end is what league of legends is how can you make sure that your five people five people on the same screen without losing any gold uh, so koi has a lot of work to do Next in line is Mad Lions for me. Uh, I think that um, Mad Lions uh, showed strength around bottom side. I think they played Lucian Nami well. They played the Lucian Lulu. I think that they have uh, some fundamental ideas that they're trying to execute on within the game, which I think is inherently positive. And I can see what Mad Lions are trying to achieve. They are playing together as a group. And of course, Mad Lions, of course, we are keeping in mind that they had a weaker schedule. They had a weaker schedule and uh, they managed to pick up some victories. But I think the fact that, you know, Kazi and Hilly is, is working out together. You know, people are going to say, well, Hilly, he died a lot in the third game, but that game was already in a dumpster. And he was just trying to, to, to make something crazy happen, you know? He's trying to flash Polymorph just to, you know, at least lose this lost game with throwing everything on the table and i don't think we should judge hilly for that because might as well do it you know so the first game very clean clear execution this was the game we talked about sk just kept engaging when they didn't need to uh, i think here Elioria was quite it was 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 quiet in this game but that was okay uh, Mad Lions just won against uh, SK by being better players. Niski playing Victor, which was a good look. Uh, later on, we had Mad Lions against Astralis. This was a game that uh, was completely finished over the back of some ganks and Akali being way too fed. Syndra died once, twice, and then the game was over. Akali being ahead is not something you want to run into. And Akali playing against this team composition is pretty much a dream. Finally, we had Mad Lions against Vitality. This game, Vitality broke the ankles of Mad Lions by ganking mid on a very, very unique timing. So basically, Bo got pushed out of his own jungle. They're invading with Wukong. Bo loses a lot of HP. The situation looks really good. Mad with a very principled invade. Vi gets pushed out. They're assuming that Vi is going to go to Golems. What does she do? She waits for Wukong to start the blue. She goes around and then she ganks mid. She manages to get a kill on the Victor and all of a sudden the game that was in shambles for the Vi all of a sudden opens up. And this is where the players like Bo and Malrang are definitely showing a whole nother level. They're playing around vision uh, better than most. I think Elioya has been always very, very good at playing around camps. But he's been worse at playing around Vision in contrast to what Bo and Marang has shown so far. Later on, Elioya was in a situation where he was trying to catch the Azir. Vi was in location, and then all of a sudden the game uh, blew up completely. Vi and Azir were just way too strong. But then again, still, Mad Lion showed good ideas that show that they are trying to achieve the fundamentals, which I think is a good place to be when you are starting in week one. In comparison to all the other teams on this table, I can follow the line of thinking of Mad Lions, and I think that 
reviewing their games is going to be a lot more fruitful than reviewing some of the other games that we saw, like the XL games or the SK games or the BDS games, right? I can understand the idea that Mad Lions is trying to execute as they're playing the game, and I think this is a very positive sign. I believe uh, we should make room for another tier. I think Mad Lions belongs here. Third best team for me, uh, we already mentioned, is Fnatic. So, Fnatic, even though they went 1-2, it might be surprising to you, um, Fnatic had a very tough weekend. They lost against the two teams that are above them on the list. And um, they managed to claw their way back against Koi. They had a good draft against Koi. I honestly think Fnatic had good drafts in the majority of the games. Uh, but looking back at uh, what they showed, Fnatic in game one against Vitality, they managed to come back. They showed a Kindred. This game was super good. They managed to secure four strikes, first Herald. And generally speaking, Fnatic were in a very good position to finish this game with the sole point that they secured. I think Fnatic's play around objectives has been very solid. But then they threw, of course, first after they took the second match of the game. And they had that terrible team fight. Syndra flashed forward and Graves survived. And then all of a sudden it was a shamble. Reckless was not posturing to fight. He was looking to base. And then he was way too far to participate. He was not involved at all. And it was just Fnatic looking very disjointed in this game. Vitality saw the opportunity. And Bo and, of course, Photon really delivered some insane gameplay in this one i think also kaiser played phenomenally well this is something that rox needs to work on in terms of how he opens up on the map and how he finds opportunities to connect with his jungle and mid lane i think this is something that the rocks needs to work on super super hard in order to compete against the likes of mickey and and kaiser currently that have performed super super good but Fnatic's mid game has looked very good even in positions where they are weaker, even in positions where they're behind, they have looked pretty decent. And I think that's very positive. The main concern for Fnatic is how do they maneuver around the likes of Caitlyn, the likes of Lucian, the likes of Yumi and Heimerdinger. These are four champions that are very strong that we already talked about on this channel. And they haven't played any of them so far. They played one Yumi game and they lost that game in three minutes. Uh, so we will have to see. In interviews and so forth, they talked about never playing Yumi again, but uh, I'll believe it when I see it. The second game against G2, as mentioned, lost in three minutes. We don't need to talk about that. Um, will probably take me longer to talk about the game than the game actually was in all reality. And then the final game, Fnatic against Koi. Here they showed a lot of class in terms of understanding the composition and being patient and winning in uh, probably the most chess-like manner. I think that uh, Fnatic is very good at finding advantages uh, through, uh, you know, uh, just macro plays and understanding, you know, how to punish someone in the enemy team being out of position. And I think this is where you can potentially see the bright side of uh, Fnatic's changes is that uh, now with the newcomers, uh, they can kind of, as the newcomers are going to be a little bit more passive in their approach, you can kind of lean in more into playing what is Humanoid's macro game. This was where sometimes Hilly and Humanoid would kind of, you know, butt heads in terms of how they wanted to approach the game. And sometimes instead of fighting or finding the best way to play the game, just committing to one way to play the game is sometimes just easier, right? And this could be the main benefit of Fnatic making changes, even though on paper, I still think that Upset and Hilly are stronger players than Reckless and Rux. So Fnatic is the third best team for me. I think that Fnatic is better than all of the teams below them. And I think in a rematch against Vitality, it would be quite competitive. But I put Vitality right next to Fnatic. So we look back at Vitality's games over the weekend. First one was against Vitality, I mean, versus Fnatic, and we mentioned it already, it was quite a steal. They stole that game away, they had a strong early game, and then Fnatic recovered super, super well. This was the game where Graves level 2 ganked Varus, and it showed Bo's ingenuity, right? The player on Vision. 
and then Vitality stole that game away with a crazy mechanical play from from Graves and uh, and then Jax like Photon. When I was watching this game, Photon and Bo looked like they really didn't belong in this one. To follow up on this, I think that Perks played quite poorly in this one. He got caught a lot on side and Kaiser was trying to help him somehow and he just got dragged along uh, dragged along on this Perks journey. Perks was getting caught over and over again on side and this was a big issue for them in the game that uh, Fnatic was very quick to punish in the mid game as mentioned before. Uh, but um, but yeah, this was like a main concern for me. It's like what the fuck is Perks doing, you know? What is happening with Perks? Because I think Kaiser played super well, Jax played, <laughs> Photon played super well, and Bo played super well. Neon was kind of in the back. I remember, you know, he's just scaling away with Ezreal. I remember there was a situation where he got Varus ulted and he died, and this was in preparation for Soul Point. So, I mean, Soul Drake. So, I think Perks' negative performance here was a standout in terms of things that were concerning. Same thing here, uh, there was a situation where uh, Perks, he dashed into Wukong and made a super winning 2v2, losing uh, through his play, and uh, that was also like a big blunder from Perks. Um, all in all, Vitality, a really, really good draft here. Uh, they showed another side of Bo, picking Sejuani and playing for Jax. I think Bo played so insanely good here, uh, this was super, super good. Yeah, that mid fight is, the, is exactly the one where Janko smites the minion. is super good, so Nautilus can land the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we we talked about it many times. And uh, here, this was the one where Perks fucked up. But Vitality, as long as they played it easy, like Bo had good impact on the top matchup. Jax was in super good conditions. Casted in here. We talked about Team Heretic's draft was very poor. Vitality just exuded, you know, the pressure of their draft and. We were very well aware of their conditions and played a very controlled game, better game, much better mid game, much cleaner in contrast to the one we saw against Fnatic. Here, Vitality banned Rise on Blue side themselves, which is an interesting adaptation. You know, uh, Rise not being having access in, to water walking is actually kind of a big deal because it's a very important rune for for Rise. Finally, we had Vitality against Mad Lions, which um, I think showed the most layers of vitality they denied the lucian a nami combo kaiser playing nami and then the ezreal comes back in vi gets locked in for bow third unique champion people thought that he's just gonna play graves hecarim and try to 1v9 but bow is just finding ways to be bow on the meta champions too which is a super good look mad lions adapts adapts with wukong lulu to give a, a champion to Lucian that he can shield and to work with uh, Lucian's passive and Lulu is a champion that it lanes well into Nami and Ezreal so here Mad Lion is showing that they can contest them both they got 2v2 kills even of course Ezreal and Nami here just need to scale then finally we had the Kaysante and then Vitality choose to pick Azir on 5 here you can consider picking Azir on 4 but I think it's perfectly fine to do the way they did it here as mentioned before, all the 2v2s around mid lane, Vitality just executed better. And here is where I let go of all my worries about perks. He played really, really well. He really dominated in this one. The early lane for it was kind of rough because he face checked into Victor and had weaker lane runes than Victor. But they recovered that beautifully with Bow. And then afterwards, they found gank after gank on the, on the, on the, on, of course, uh, sorry, on Niski because he had no flash. And all in all, this is where I let go of my worries about perks. And then later, Vitality, in the mid game, the late game, played very solid. In my mind, what happened in the, that game, in that Vitality game, was the play of the week. And I'll show it to you as soon as we've finished uh, the tier list. So Vitality is going to be a second place team, and then the first place team is G2. And I think uh, that needs no explaining. G2 is the most complete team in terms of drafting. They are by far the strongest early game team. Uh, I think Vitality might compete there, but I think G2 still looks stronger. I think that G2, all in all, you know, uh, bold lane on point in the current meta, super important. Yike has played well, many different sides to him. He's played Kindred, Graves, and Viego. Caps is showing. Uh, re-innovating the mid lane pool and 
Preparing against G2 is going to be an absolute nightmare for the other teams. G2 is an insanely strong team and you're going to uh, practice, against, practice against all of these other teams that have nowhere close to the level of G2. And G2, the only challenger that they have ahead of themselves currently is themselves. Vitality is the team that uh, we can look out to beat because, of course, we've already seen the Fnatic G2 matchup. Vitality vs G2 is going to be the most hyped matchup coming into uh, the future weeks. But all in all, G2 looks like the most complete team because, of course, Vitality looked wonky every now and then, right? But I think G2, you know, Broken Blade, also very solid. I think all in all, I don't need to talk more about G2. The worst thing that can happen to G2 is that they get bored and they drop games because of boredom and become too creative. When the IQ begins to spilling over from the grail that is G2 roster and uh, is going to spill on their lovely G2 jerseys, you know, that's something that can definitely happen. But this is where I'm at so, so far. I am happier than my, with Mad Lions than with Koi. I think that uh, the majority of the rosters definitely need to work on a lot of things. And I think the path to that location is the easiest for the teams that are currently in B tier. I can imagine Mad Lions and Koi figuring out their issues uh, better than the teams below them. And uh, this is where I'm at right now after week one, moving into week two. And this is going to take, uh, of course, uh, have weight on the uh, predictions I'm going to make. And uh, hopefully this serves as a good rundown of what happened uh, in the weekend, if you missed it. Final thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to make a little... Uh, I wanted to give out MVPs to each position. Top lane for me was Photon. I think his Jax performance really showed us a level of um, Korean Jax that uh, has been dearly missed in the region. I think Photon has been super, super strong. I think uh, second place would be Broken Blade. Uh, he's been uh, consistent and, you know, he he created, uh, you know, he's, he's just played decent. Obviously, it's, it's, it's good to, easy to look good on the team that is winning, but I think Broken Blade played good on the Karma. I think he had some good moments with Jax too. But top lane to me, uh, Photon is the, the MVP for me. In terms of jungle, goes to Bow. Might be some people out there that are going to argue for Yike, but I think Yike had some imprecisions, while Bo uh, had some moments that were simply incredible. He saved the Mad Lions game with a split-second decision, and uh, the Nash play that I'm going to show you after I've made this MVP list was simply astonishing. Bo is fantastic. And Photon and Bo is the way I believe Vitality can compete against G2. Mid lane, I think it's Caps. Caps, just fantastic. Really, really good. Really, really good. I think that uh, the other players, you know, if you look at, for example, Humanoid, he had a flash moment. Uh, he had a fantastic Jace game. Uh, and then you had Perks with his game one and game two. Didn't look that clean. And if you think about any other mid laner, I don't think anyone comes close, right? Niski had some decent performances, but it, they were against teams that were on paper much weaker, right? Bot laner, I think Hans Sama goes without saying. Hans Sama, beautiful arrows, fantastic Draven. You know, I don't think, I, I don't think there is a conversation here. Uh, someone in the chat says reckless. Yeah, okay, copium. And then support, even though he is a dirty into sometimes, Mickey X. In terms of overall impact, Mickey X was massive. I think a close second is Kaiser. I think Kaiser played really, really good too. Really loved the Braum. Really liked the Leona. Being able to pick the Nami as well, really good. Kaiser is a close second to me. All right. 
Finally, I just wanted to highlight for me what was the best play of the whole weekend. Vit versus Matt. So I'm going to break down this play for you guys. Honestly for myself, because I like it so much. So it starts off, let me paint the picture, right? Mad Lions are on the back foot, they're trying to find ways to claw themselves back into the game. The enemy Azir is super super strong and they catch Photon. He tries to get away by ulting over the wall, but he just doesn't reach. He doesn't have the angle. Doesn't have the angle. He dies, and then Mad Lions are thinking, wow, this is our moment to, you know, pressure Nasher. We are currently 4v5 and the enemy team is pushing towards mid lane. We are going to look to start it. The Ezreal ult. The Ezreal ult uh, just shaves them, the HP goes down. And then here at this point, you know, my lions maybe need to consider, oh shit, they're already here, the TP comes in from Azir. It's not super, super clear what they can do and they need to back off, right? So they give it a little tease, they give it a little taster, and you pretty much have this circumstance where Mad Lions need to run. But the conversion here from Vitality is something that we haven't seen so often. The fact that they keep it leashed and they are playing with the fact that they outrange the enemy super, super far. Guys, we don't care about who said what. It really doesn't matter. Let's, like, you guys are arguing, you, you, you are, you're measuring your ep -ness over something that is so pointless. None of you guys made the play, so let's just enjoy it, okay? So Bo keeps it leashed, and the, the beautiful thing here is that Vitalis is not hitting it. They're not hitting it. Vi is just tanking it. They're not hitting it. They just want to keep it leashed. They want to make sure that this Baron doesn't, doesn't go down in HP. Ezreal, you know, keep his passive stacks, that's okay, no problem. You know, no problem at all. They're buying time, buying time, and then eventually Mad Lions realizes, like, we're getting fucked here. We need to peace out. We just need to go away. They're trying, they're, all of a sudden they realize we, we can't even enter. We can't engage. We have no Wukong ult. Our Nar Mega is running out. And we are completely doomed. Completely doomed. And then the sweeper to put, spot the Wukong and then the smite to come in. Gorgeous. Really, really good. Another thing that I wanted to show in this game, just to, to show a highlight, is to see the position of how fucked Bo is here, okay? So Bo is so tough here. It's like, Bo is in such a rough spot. He gets invaded, Wukong pushes him out, Lulu has Pryo, they push out the enemy team. This is all good, right? But what Vi does is, he just goes around and he finds this angle on the mid, mid gank. A lot of Vi players are not going to look to go for this, they're just going to go and cry and base and then try to find some respawn of the camp and Niski. Niski definitely, you know, got smacked on the head here. He felt safe, Vi was pushed out, they thought he was fucked. Obviously the follow up here was kind of crazy, the, the fact that they're tanking this wave and they don't know what the fuck they're doing, so it's a bit troll. Uh, but all in all, Bo is flashing to get gold. Like, Bo is flashing to get gold because he has no jungle. All in all, that is my rundown of uh, the LEC for this weekend. I think I'm gonna call it a day there, guys. I think we've done enough. Uh, if you missed anything, it's all going to be on YouTube. Uh, for today, uh, what is going to be posted is the LEC tier list. And then finally, what is going to be posted is my uh, reaction to the pop quiz. Uh, we are going to continue tomorrow with reviewing the Vitality games and highlighting their strengths and potential weaknesses. And uh, then we're going to be watching the LCK games. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, hopefully, I, I applied for LCS co-streaming rights. I hope that I get that through. That could be a lot of fun. I will not be live streaming the next weekend because I will be on the analyst desk.
I'll be on the analyst desk and uh, you'll miss me, but I'll be on the stream. So at least there's that, guys. Okay, when does the analysis start? I think tomorrow, maybe at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, something like this. I'll update you on, on Twitter. But um, we shall see. Will you be cool streaming LPL? I have to see. Honestly, the hours for cool streaming LPL are very rough for me. And I don't like the fact that I can't pause and talk about what's happening on the screen and to learn more about the players and the teams. It's kind of what I like to do when I watch uh, LCK and LPL. So I, I have to kind of think about it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Who do we raid? Who do you want to raid? Whoa, that was loud. Bo? Is this the real Bo? Is he called Ziblol? Nice. Bo is gangster shit, guys. Oh shit. Oh, you wanna see? 